what's going on guys it's brian with simpleman's comics and if you're interested in this week's first appearances reader buzz and variant buzz then you've come to the right place because this is the cbsi bolo show with me as always is my co-host jack tomeo aka mr bolo what's going on buddy excited to be here brian like you said we are here talking about this week's hottest new release comics and we're not talking about the hottest comics according to my opinion we're not talking about the hottest comics according to brian's opinion or cbsi we're talking about the hottest comics according to your opinion the readers the viewers the followers all of you out there on social media all of you out there posting books that you're excited about because this is the bolo list and bolo of course stands for be on the lookout and we are talking about the books that you guys are letting us know to be on the lookout for Right before we get further into the show, it's important to know that this show is available on podcast, audio version on iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play. And the show also is sponsored by Nick Dwartman at SlabbedHeroes.com. If you're looking for that modern guarantee 9-8 at a great price, check out SlabbedHeroes.com. And he even has some new listings up there right now from books that are on this week's Bolo list. And as Jack previously mentioned... This comes out every Tuesday night, Wednesday morning, covering the first appearances, reader buzz, and variant buzz, as well as Jack's long-term play. What else do we say about this list, Jack? Well, again, it's not our list. We call ourselves the guardians of the list. This is your list. These are the books that you guys are talking about on social media. Brian and I run the social media arm for comicbookinvest.com, better known as CBSI. Uh, we also do social media through Simpleman's Comics, my personal page, a.k.a. Mr. Bolo. Um, we are checking out what you guys are talking about on Twitter, on Instagram, on uh, Facebook, on various social media platforms, and we and YouTube especially. And we want to know what you guys are looking forward to, what you guys are expecting to be big, what you guys are going to be buying. We put all that information together. We create this comic book cheat sheet that lets you know what has an opportunity to be popular, uh, what people are talking about what people are specking on as well as all of the spoiler information that we have leading into the day's new comic book releases right and real quick before we get into the first appearances it's important to let you guys know this show is pre-recorded on wednesday nights and then live premiered thursdays at 9 p.m so that way we can participate in the live chat with you guys so do us a favor click that thumbs up button and if this is your first time here consider subscribing that way you won't miss future bolo show or any of the other videos on simple man's comics and with that being said we're going to get into the first appearances of the week starting with arrow number three now this was the first appearance of what sea hunter and keystone right Right, two new characters coming into this um, kind of Arrow story, which spins off of the Age of At Agents of Atlas story. Uh, again, we've talked about this on the show a lot. Now, I I'm not reading this series. I haven't read this issue. I'm not really familiar with these characters. But they're certainly doing a lot of world building surrounding the characters spawning from the Agents of Atlas. We've seen this with Swordmaster. Um, we've talked about this uh, with Arrow. Um, yeah. They definitely, looks like Marvel definitely wants to get into these characters long term. Um, we know that the kind of like the Chinese Asian market is very important to um, the Marvel cinematic universe, to Marvel as a whole and their bottom line. And we always tell you to follow the money. Um, if you're looking at investing, look at investing where Marvel and where companies like Marvel are investing their money. Um, the most popular character that seems to... Um, the coming out of Agents of Atlas is the character who's featured on the variant cover, that 1 in 25 um, incentive cover by Pop Man, um, Wave. Wave is featured on the bottom of that cover. You see the big trade dress lettering saying Wave. Um, she has definitely been the one who seems to have gotten the most attention. She's a new Filipino character. Um, there was a lot of buzz on her Philippines exclusive variant that came out before Agents of Atlas. Um, that was like that War of Realms, Agents of Atlas number one variant. And ever since then, any cover that she's been featured on seems to get the, the most buzz of any of them. So I think that that was driving a lot of the demand for that 125. I saw that 125 posted continuously on Instagram. Um, so I, I think that a lot of people were looking out for that. It seems to not quite be a ratio book yet. But again, we filmed this Wednesday, so there's still time. I don't think that era number three is going to be immensely ordered. Um, and I like the fact that, again, from it's a tough guess when we're talking speculation, but I like the fact that you're looking at $4 for a book 
you're looking at two first appearances. It, you know, it's pretty safe. Um, I won't say safe, but I'll say it's a low cost investment to try to get in on um, to see if any of these characters end up turning out to be anything um, that Marvel's able to draw on, whether it's cinematically or in the future as part of the publishing arm. They seem to be very invested in these characters, though. Right, and then the next book for first appearances this week was G.I. Joe number one, and this can had like, multiple first appearances in it, right? Right, this is one I was obviously very excited about. You watch the channel, you know I'm a big G.I. Joe guy. Um, there are a lot of negative feelings about this book amongst uh, some of the G.I. Joe typical readers, some of the speculators. Um, and, you know, I think that people didn't necessarily know what they were getting themselves into. This is a different kind of Joe story. This isn't Joe versus Cobra in an all-out battle. This isn't that militaristic style story that we're used to seeing from G.I. Joe. Instead, this is uh, kind of like a future story where we're imagining a world where Cobra has taken over. It's taken over the United States. They're running every facet of government. And um, now the Joes have had to go underground. Um, they've been defeated. And they are looking for civilians to work as shadow operatives to help topple this like evil Cobra regime. So we're introduced to some new characters who will most likely become these civilian Joes. Um, and again, the... the the issue moves kind of slowly, so we don't yet know who's important, who's not. Um, I don't even know if this should be considered a first appearance book because I don't know if, like an indie book, these are just you know characters who are going to come and go. I don't know if these are characters that are going to have long time Joe lore. Um, but either way, this is a book to keep an eye out for. Um, I, as soon as the solicitation came out, this was one I was paying attention to, regardless of whether or not I'm a GI Joe fan. I think it's a book with potential. We look at some of the problems they've had with G.I. Joe movies. This could be a different spin on it, a um, different way of kind of approaching a G.I. Joe movie in the future. Uh, so I'm interested in this story. Regardless of the first issue being a little slow, uh, I am all in to read this story. So from a reader buzz perspective, I'm excited about it. Um, from a speculation perspective, we'll have to see. It needs other people to get excited about it to see if any of these characters are really going to pop off and become something. But we've also talked about when you're paying attention to IDW incentive variants to watch out for the times when IDW does more than just the one in 10 incentive. And you see that here, those first two books, or I'll say the middle two books that you can see on your screen right there. Those are the incentives. Um, you're looking at one in 10 and I believe one in 25. Uh, and the, whenever IDW does that, they're a little more invested. And the book on the far right is my favorite cover. And that's from Frankie's comics, Frankie's comics.com. Now, Frankie's Comics does a lot of exceptional store exclusive variants. This one is no different. And what I really like about this is, as a G.I. Joe fan, you're talking about a book that's usually printed in like the 10,000 level. You tend to get kind of up and coming artists um, and artists who are more synonymous with G.I. Joe. Instead, here we get Clayton Crane, who's an A list artist by any right, does a ton of obviously big two work, both Marvel and DC cover B's. Um, and here we're getting a Clayton Crane Cobra variant. Very cool. Um, as a G.I. Joe fan, that's the type of book I get pumped up about. So uh, shout out to Frankie's for putting this one together. And that is still available on Frankie'sComics.com. And that is my favorite cover of any of the books. And I know some people are not huge on store exclusives, but this is where I think store exclusives can be successful is when they create a book that's kind of hands down better than the ones that IDW themselves created. Yeah, I agree. I like that Clayton Crane cover because it kind of has that old 80s mo action movie poster look to it. Plus that Clayton mm -hmm. Crane style art. So that's one of my favorites. But we also want to give full disclosure. This channel does have Frankie's Comics as a sponsor. So we want to make sure that information is out there. But with that being said, gorgeous cover. Either way, I like that. And I actually ordered some from the site myself. And the next one was Spider-Man. We're putting that off for now. We're going to talk about that book in a little bit. And we're going to move Oh, yeah. On. I'm excited to talk about that book. Right into the Reader Buzz section for this week. Flash Forward number one. Now, Flash Forward number one could have fallen into a couple different categories on this, um, on this list and on this show. First off, I'm going to talk about the variant. In Yuck Lee killed this variant. I saw this book posted. This was a late breaker. I saw this one posted a lot. It sold out at Midtown Comics, sold out at several of the larger online retailers. Um, just gorgeous cover art. I, I think most people tend to kind of enjoy In Huckley's work, and I think that this is a prime example of why. But for me, this book is about reader buzz. 
Now, to, to read this series, this is a Wally West solo series. Wally West in the cosmic, uh, kind of a cosmic solo series. But this is a story spawning out of Heroes in Crisis. And I've talked about on the channel my affinity for Heroes in Crisis. I think it was an amazing story, a uh, story written by Tom King. And I know we talked about Tom King just yesterday on the hot and cold show, firmly in the cold category. But that stems from kind of like the market's perception of him based upon his Batman run. And, you know, while that Batman run may have been that Batman run, Heroes in Crisis is a story that I really advocate. It's It comes from a different perspective. It was a kind of whodunit mystery. Um, it took place at a place called The Sanctuary, which is kind of like a facility where – um, battle-worn heroes and uh, villains who wanted to possibly become something more can go to and recharge both physically and mentally. Um, it's a story that really dealt with like PTSD and things like that, things that really related to Tom King, who's you know an ex-military, ex-CIA member. And uh, it's a story I really advocate. I think it's different, and I, and I enjoyed it. Um, so Wally West now is at a point post- Heroes in Crisis, where he's got to kind of deal with, you know, guilt and figuring out what to do next. And um, those kind of questions, my, you know, my enjoyment of reading Heroes in Crisis has me ready to read Flash Forward. Um, so I think if you enjoyed Heroes in Crisis, I, I know you'll be on board with reading Flash Forward. If you were thinking about picking this one up, I would suggest go back and read Heroes in Crisis, um, because I think it'll give you even more context of why... Wally's kind of psyche is where it is. Completely agree with you, Jack. That Enhyak Lee cover is out of this world. Ha <laughs> flash forward. But either way, that's one I definitely had in my pull list this week. I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but I'm definitely excited to do so. And moving on into the reader buzz section, we have Forever Maps number one. And this is from Scout Comics. Right, this is part of their binge series, and if you're not familiar with their binge series, their binge line of books, essentially what it is is they release an issue number one, and after the issue number one, they go straight to the trade paperback. The trade paperback encompasses issue number one and every other issue in the series, only releasing one flop issue, and then the rest as that collected trade, um, and, it's, and it's kind of like their Netflix-style release system. Um, the original kind of binge release that a lot of people are familiar with is that Metal Shark Bro um, which did pretty well in the secondary market initially, at least. Um, Forever Maps is an interesting story. It's a story that kind of intrigues me from a speculation perspective um, because it sounds like something that could be adapted at some point. You're talking about a character who discovers a map, follows the map, and leads them to another map. They follow that map, lead them to another map, follow that map, lead them to another map, and so on and so forth. At some point, they start to realize as they're following these maps that they're not aging. Um, so it's kind of that classic immortality story of, well, do I continue to follow these maps and live um, immortally, essentially, um, not age, and see where this takes me, or do I stop because everything around me is, is still aging at a regular rate, and you know the people that I care about and, and the things that I care about are changing, and um, you know it's, it's kind of that struggle right there, and then that... It, just that elevator pitch is that's the kind of thing that's successful for Hollywood studios. That's the kind of thing that gets people intrigued. Um, you know, that solicitation in and of itself got me intrigued. So this is one I'm looking forward to reading. And the great thing about these binge series is you pick up number one, you give it a read. If you like it, then you can read the entire series in trade form. So I, I think that's a, a great concept uh, created by James Hake of Scout Comics. I'm a big fan of that. Right, and this is one book that I didn't even have on my radar until I saw your bolo list, and we were talking about this book earlier before we started recording the show. But I'm interested to pick this up to read it. Right now, of course, my favorite book from Scout Comics is Category Zero. But um, either way, Forever Maps number one, like we've discussed on this channel time and time again about how great we like that, that whole binge concept. Yeah. So definitely make sure you check out Forever Maps or... Like you said, wait for that binge trade to come out next. The, the next book we're going to talk about in the Reader Buzz section is Steeple Number 1 from Dark Horse Comics. Right, and Steeple is an interesting one. Um, I don't know if this is in the right category, and I'll say that because Cover B seems to be dominantly selling over Cover A. Um, cover A has more of a cartoony look, 
than cover B. So I, I don't know if it's so much that people like cover B as maybe they don't love cover A. But, you know, this one is, you know, two women with like a completely different worldview kind of end up on this like long travel together. Um, you know, they're facing demons, curses and the rapture. Um, it doesn't necessarily initially appeal to me if I'm being just quite honest. Um, but you have to give these Dark Horse number ones another look. Why is that, Brad? Because of that first look deal they have with Netflix. Exactly. And you know how I feel about Netflix speculation. Um, and again, I don't know if this is just some sucker play that Dark Horse has got me buying these Dark Horse number ones because you don't know what the hell is going to come out of it and what's going to get adapted by Netflix. But anything that shows up on Netflix has a solid speculation opportunity because of just the vast viewership that it's going to get. But at least all Dark Horse number ones are getting a second look from me. This is one I don't get too excited about per se but i'm at least paying attention to it and it seemed that a lot of people on the market were paying attention to it um cover b uh went real quick to one per order on midtown um it sold out i think on tfaw so you know that that piqued my interest and made me say well people are buying it um so let us know in the chat if you read it um am i counting it for no reason um you know i'm always open to hear what people like a lot of times guys i end up picking up books after the bolo show just from y'all's recommendation i would have never read bone parish if people didn't constantly tell me you need to read bone parish so let, let us know let us know in the chat if this was a book you read and book you're interested in and um if it's a book we need to be checking out right the next book on the list is one of my favorite indies right now really enjoyed the first issue was actually able to read th this issue today and we're talking about Shows in number two. Yeah, you know what? This one surprised me, Brian. This was a book that um, I, obviously I like Mad Cape Studios. We've done great work with Mad Cape Studios. Be on the lookout for that upcoming Mad Cape Studios variant very soon. Um, got a little something cooked up. Um, I, you know what? I don't even want to tell you more. I'm just excited about it. But I'll say be on the lookout very soon. Probably this time next week we'll be talking about it. But um, Show's End is a book that, um, you know, when it got solicited, I was like, that's a little different. And I think that's what I like about Mad Cave is that all of their releases seem very different. It's a lot of um, publishers fall into like genre based releases where it's like, well, that's a horror publisher or, you know, they do suspense stories. Mad Cave is all over the board. Um, and this it's interesting that this book actually came from their Mad Cave talent search. So if you see those talent search, I know we have a lot of artists and a lot of aspiring writers um, that watch the channel and that comment. And we've I've had multiple people who I've had discussions with who have encouraged to enter the Mad Cave talent search. I mean, this is this is a book that really spawned out of that. I really enjoyed issue number one. Um, I thought it was a, a good issue and it's a really an interesting story. So I, I was hooked and ready to read number two. And like a lot of Mad Cave releases, this one's doing pretty well in the secondary market because it's just not heavily ordered. There's still a lot of retailers who aren't on the Mad Cave trend. Um, I, I, we've gotten hammered before. Like we over promote Mad Cave because we do um, variants with them. And I think what people don't understand is – the, again, the bowl of this comes from what people are talking about. So it all it depends on what the people within our bubble are talking about. The people within our bubble are you, the viewers. Um, it's it's other retail shops. It's other um, it's large, obviously larger retail shops. Um, other kind of like social media influencers, and you know people who are heavy, heavy into comics respect these kinds of books and talk about these kinds of books. But we're still seeing those LCSs. And look, I live in Rock Hill, South Carolina. I promise you my LCS did not have Show's End number one on the shelf, did not have Show's End number two on the shelf. That's just the way that that goes. So, again, that's another reason why we do the pre-FOC show, um, the last call show right here on Friday nights. Um, so we can let you guys know what books may be. Hey, this book you might need to let your LCS know because they may not order it. But this is a book that I think was slept on. Um, so it's a surprise to see number two drying up and doing exceptionally well. 
And shout out to Andy Tomberlin of the Indie Spotlight Series and uh, BatComicShop.com. And by the way, Andy Tomberlin announced just today he is coming back to CBSI and ComicBookInvest.com next week. We're very excited to have him back. We told you he wouldn't be gone long. Um, but he is back, and he did an exclusive for number one that I thought was fantastic. So I like this series. This one caught me uh, – caught me off guard and uh, I'm this is one of my favorite ones to read right now as far as like indie books right and you mentioned about getting the flight because we do variants with mad cave but a lot of that is we do variants because we like mad cave stories I mean it wouldn't make much sense to do variants for a book or a company that you don't like so either way right. we do well I say we CBSI has a couple exclusives with mad cave and vault two of our favorite indie publishers but shows in I'm telling you, great read. Some people don't like it. I've actually enjoyed it. Really enjoyed number two. But with that being said, we're going to move into the next pick on the reader bus section. And it is You Are Obsolete number one. And this is another late breaker, Brian. This is another one that um, wasn't initially on my radar. And then I actually, it's funny, you know, I've talked about these Aftershock books. And I've said, man, when am I going to stop buying these because they just don't do anything on the secondary market? And I started getting a couple people teasing me uh, in DMs like, is this going to be the one you stop on? Because I'm buying this one. And that made me go, the FOMO set in on me, Brian. I started saying, well, damn it, everybody else seems to be buying this book. Maybe this is going to be the one. Um, and sure enough, you know, it kind of started being short supply a bit um, on New Comic Book Day. The funny thing is that um, that incentive variant on the right is by Francisco Francavilla, who is – a very popular artist, does Marvel work. Especially really in the no- horror genre. Right, really known for his Archie and Sabrina covers. But it seems like cover A is the one that's getting a lot of attention. And uh, this is a book where kids create an app, which ends up like killing adults. Yeah, it's like a children, modern children of the corn. <laughs> right, exactly. So, um, you know, I got to say, again, elevator pitch wise, if I'm a movie studio, I hear that and I'm like, okay, I can, I can see something with that. So it's a, a, that's enough for me to check a book out, read issue number one, and see if there's something there to read further. So I kind of like this one. We'll have to see where it goes. And again, this is another one. If you I haven't read yet. If you guys read it, um, let us know in the chat, good, bad, and different. We want to hear it. Right. And the next book in the Reader Buzz, of course, one of the big titles of the week was Absolute Carnage number three. Had that classified oh, yeah, I got variant, right? Yes, we actually had two classified variants for this book. I had to refill my drink for this one because we got to get into this one, Brian. A um, lot bloop, going bloop, on. Bloop, bloop. <laughs> right, a lot, lot going on with this issue. I got to lean in. I got to stretch out. Um, I think that the one of the most polarizing things we talk about is absolute carnage. Um, I mentioned it on the Hot and Cold show. This was my hot pick. And what I said was it's just everything absolute carnage is red hot. So, um, you know, I only went through this book very quickly. I want to sit down and really digest this book. But the kind of the main events of this book are the death of Norman Osborn. Um, we get uh, Sleeper the Cat, um, which, again, I think that's just – Sleeper's still going to be something. There's still going to be more to Sleeper. And then at the end, we get Venomized Hulk, which seems to be perfect timing right before we get into that Immortal Hulk Absolute Carnage one-shot. The two um, classified variants that came with this book, we got um, the uh, Doppelganger uh, Miles Morales action figure variant and the uh, Venomized Hulk design variant young gun variant the young gun variant is doing exceptionally well in the secondary market seeing sales as high as twenty dollars it's another one shame on you retailers who are out there i'm seeing a lot of retailers mark that book up come on now that's a cover price variant you are the first market you are not the second market for the second market to work appropriately and as it should you need to sell books as they are intended to be sold otherwise you are breaking the market you are impeding the market's progress and you end up hurting yourself in the long run i don't care what a book's going for on ebay um you are supposed to sell it for what you are supposed to sell it now if it's a week later or something like that by all means um if you had the foresight to order yourself extra copies for back stock that's a little different but um i'm seeing a lot of 
15 and $20 price tags are being sent to me on that one. I hate to see that, but it's at this point it's getting to be expected. Um, another thing that had a lot of buzz on it is that, um, the kind of, uh, red goblin codex 125. A lot of people were talking about one of the ones uh, that I like that has been brought up in the comments on previous videos is that, that connecting, we talk about selling books as a sets. We talk about how hot those connecting variants are for powers yep. of X house of X, but the connecting variants for these absolute carnage, as mentioned by someone in the comments, I'm sorry, I forgot who, who was commenting about it, but those are, and then I've seen pictures of them set up already. The first three issues so far, those connecting variants are badass. Yeah, and they haven't quite done in the secondary market what, what I think they will do, but they're starting to gain momentum. I also really like the way the trade dresses is. It reminds me of like an old horror movie. Yeah. Um, so I agree with you, Brian. I think those are those have legs. Um, but yeah, the, the, the Codex variant, Red Goblin, I know a lot of you are really invested in Red Goblin and excited. You know, there's a lot of, I think there was a lot of misinformation. I don't know. Is that Normie on the cover of that? Because I think it might be Norman. Because he ends up dying in the issue. I think that's why they put him on the the cover. Because he thinks he is Carnage. Um, you know, that's kind of the whole point. Um, but in my mind, when I saw that death, I said, Normie and Dylan had been kind of forming this bond, right? They were kind of like the kids in the story kind of working together. I wonder if this death by at the hands of Venom is, isn't going to lead to... What I'm hoping, what I've been speculating on, which is Dylan versus Normie. I think if Dylan's going to be ultimately become some sort of symbiote hero that a lot of us are hoping, I think Normie would be that natural enemy, that natural arch rival. That's pure speculation. You can hammer me in the comment section and tell me, uh, no, I read it in this, that, and the third. And But it's, again, that's what speculation is. I'm just... Is that Yosemite Sam? Yeah, that's, that's my speculative <laughs> voice. You're <gotten> figure... <laughs> That's how that's when I'm reading all of your salty comments. That's the voice I'm reading up. Um, so yeah, so that's a, uh, you know, that's I think what I've been speculating on. That's what I've been thinking that this is going to ultimately get to. Um, so I'm hopeful that these events only pushed it closer to that, and then it'll be really interesting. We just talked about Absolute Carnage number four. It's funny, we talked about Absolute Carnage number four, Brian, on the last call show, right? And we talked about um, we talked about the fact that they alluded to something huge happening in three, and we said, that the way it sounded, it had to be a death. Yeah. Um, now, if we think about Absolute Carnage four, right, they said the events of the death would change the direction of things, so this death with Norman has to then change something, right? It has to make something go in a different direction. I think well, they Norm didn't say events of the death. They said, what was it? Like, yeah, well, yeah. Of, whatever events. happened last issue type. Yeah. Right. But we could read between the lines and we felt like it was a death. Um, and again, that's the point of the last call show is we're giving you our vision into what we see when we read these. We don't It could be right, could be wrong, but we hope if you watch us, you're not hate watching. You're watching because you actually want to hear the opinions of Brian and Bolo to see what we are going to say. And, um, you know, that was the feeling we got from reading that solicitation. And I feel better about that. Again, I, I really think we could be going somewhere with Normie. We'll see. Um, but that's kind of the feeling that I'm getting. And, and I tell you what, my before anyone uh, – tries to pump and dump comment me. I'll be the first one to tell you, I've talked about it on the channel before. I got a short box full of ASM 798 that I misspeculated on way back when, like everybody else on the FOMO of Red Goblin. But um, yeah, I, like everybody else, am oversaturated with that, with that book. So um, I'm not out here pumping that in hopes. Uh, I'm hoping the events do that for me. But we'll see. We'll see how it's going. Either way, man, I am loving this series, Brian. I'm loving reading this series. It's it's the book that I look forward to the most. Um, I was already a Donny Cates fan from like early on, and like as soon as I met him and interviewed him, I thought, man, this is a genuine guy. This is a guy that uh, I'm interested to see where his career goes. I literally interviewed him a week before he signed with Marvel, um, and he told me that the two stories he wanted to write the most were. Spider-Man, and I guess in a way he's getting to do that, and Buffy the Vampire Slayer. For all of you Buffy haters who get bad when we talk about Buffy the Vampire Slayer, 
be on the lookout for that eventual Downey Cates Buffy story because it's going to come eventually. <laughs> but uh, then then watch, Brian. Then Buffy spec will be red hot. But, you know, um, yeah, so I, I'm excited for this one. I, I think it's gone exactly how Donny Cates and Ryan Stegman would have liked it to have gone. Yeah. I don't know who Buffy is, but I love Slayer. <laughs> <laughs> Want to be a VJ. Either way, next one in the reader buzz section was House of X number five. Yeah, another one with some big events um, that kind of had readers very, very, very excited. It's funny when you mention Absolute Carnage, Brian. Doesn't it seem like you're either in the Absolute Carnage or the House Powers of X circle? Doesn't it seem like people can't be in both? I've enjoyed both, but it seems like people pick a side. I have to pick a side. I'm picking Absolute Carnage, and I'm going to be very honest with you. You can call me dumb. I'll take that. House of X and Powers of X is a much more intensive read. I have to like look stuff up and do my research on some of these characters, even though I grew up an X-Men fan, um, versus as Kate's more simplistic writing. But I've enjoyed House and Powers of X. This is a big issue. Um, we get to see what like those gold orbs are. They're actually more like eggs. Um, kind of advances the story there. Uh, it's Again, I, these some of these books take me two, three reads, though, before I like – fully grasp everything that's going on beautiful cover art again connecting covers killing it the flower variants tough to come by the one in ten huddlesons in demand um i mean you can basically bank on that at this point yeah i'm interested to see how many people pick up those action figure variants right because it's We've talked about how they've kind of been exhausted. I understand how they help the story, I guess, but John Tyler Christopher doing what Marvel action figure variants for what four years now? Right, right. I saw a picture on Instagram of a collector who had an entire wall of action figure variants. It was pretty cool looking though. Yeah. It was pretty cool looking to see that many Marvel characters depicted in an action figure variant. Yeah, the only thing is the cards have been punched on all of them, right? <laughs> yeah right right there's no one punch oh brian brian don't give them don't give them variant ideas <laughs> don't give them unpunched variant <laughs> ideas get the yeah the unpunched of the of the punched action figure variant yeah that'll be like the one in 100 unpunched edition <laughs> yeah then the next one we're going to talk about is of course once in future number two this is one book i've been excited for to come out because they've been putting like more than on like 78th print, <laughs> yeah. number one. I'm glad to get a new issue to read. Well, and this is essential for anyone who's hating on Once in Future, who's like, oh, it's all just a scheme. Um, you know, it's, you know, it's this, it's that. Uh, you know, th th you got to keep the story going so, so people can see what Boom Studios was so excited to bring to the public because Boom knew they had a hit on their hands, which is why they, they, um, strategize the release the way that they did and uh sure enough i think uh number two which i haven't gotten a chance to read but seems reader buzz wise what i'm reading in reviews what i'm reading from your comments out there who are posting your um hauls from today a lot of people loved it it seems to have that buzz they're already going late print on this one aren't they brian yeah and so, what they got that new york comic-con variant right yeah, they announced a New York Comic Con uh, variant, two two New York Comic Con variants for number one. Um, you've got a uh, a regular convention exclusive, which I think has like a thousand print run. I don't think they really announced it, but and then you've got a super limited one hundred print run, um, which is incredible. We saw two indie publishers announce one hundred print runs, and I'm gonna do a little bragging for ComicBookInvest.com. Um, we actually got to make the exclusive announcement for vault comics for uh the plot number one the uh the kind of metallic variant they're doing uh limited to 100 i tell you what brian it's gonna be real interesting to see what these indie variants limit out of 100 do on the secondary market with both once in future and the plot i think they are going to have astronomical secondary market prices 100 is nothing that's going to be tough to get your hands on right i'm gonna draw my own and it's going to be so rare because it's just going to be the only one. 
<laughs> I don't know. I don't know if that's gonna work, Brian. <laughs> Might not be the best looking cover, but it's mine, and it's only one of them. But yeah, once future number two, I haven't had a chance to read this yet. I'm dying to. Um, absolutely love the first issue. Like I said, it kind of remind me of um, Indiana Jones meets Stop or My Mama Shoot, but instead of it's a a doobie rolling grandma. And the last book in the reader bus section was another indie from Red 5, and this was Butcher Queen, right? Right, and you know what? This one was not on my, like, FOC radar. This wasn't a book that I was paying attention to some 23 days ago when it got foc But you guys in the community were all over this one. There was a lot of posts about this book. Um, there was a lot of demand for this book. The pre-sales on this book were huge. Um, we had to actually delete several um, kind of solicitations for sales, Brian, on the Facebook group before this book came out. So um, this is one that a lot of people were really paying attention to within like the couple days before its release. Um, you're looking at a book that's already 10 to $15 on the secondary market. Um, there is a SDCC preview that is on fire right now, um, doing twenty five to thirty dollars. But it, this one's selling briskly at ten to fifteen dollars in and of itself. So if you're able to find this one on the shelves um, at your LCS, whether it's tomorrow or this weekend, this is one you might want to grab because I think it's a easy short term flip. So I want to know, especially if anyone who's watching this has read this, is the story good, or are people riding that red five heat? You know, and, and, and we've seen that before, haven't we? Yeah, and seeing oh, other Red Five books have gotten hot. There's a new Red Five title, so I'm gonna go pick that up. Um, but I haven't had a chance to read it yet, so I'm anxious to know: is the story good, or is it just because it's it's Red Five, new book from a hot publisher at the moment? But and that brings us to the end of the reader buzz section tonight. So real quick, I want to thank everyone that's in the chat with us tonight. This is pre-recorded. We record it the night before and then live premiere it for people that are new to this video. Um, so make sure you click that thumbs up button for us. And if this is your first time here, consider subscribing. And we're going to move right on into the variant buzz. First book we got on the variant buzz is the Star Wars Age of Resistance. Ray, this is what, the 1 in 50 Casada variant, right? Right. Now, I was almost tempted, Brian, to make this my long-term play of the week. But I just don't typically do high-ratio variants like this um, because they're just not accessible to so many people. But no doubt this one is already a successful book selling for about $100. So you're looking at double ratio. If you can find this one for ratio, guys, pick this up. And I'm going to tell you why. Um, if you remember the uh, Star Wars Force Awakens adaptation, number one, there was a one in one hundred Casada. He later um, he later solicited another variant featuring Ray later on that then got canceled. Um, and I think Star Wars fans were feverishly waiting on another high ratio Casada Ray variant, and this I think fits that mold. It was kind of a no brainer to me that this was going to do well. I don't think a lot of shops out there are ordering 50 copies of a lot of these Age of Resistance number ones. I, we've talked about this. A lot of these variants have been slept on and done exceptionally well in comparison to their ratio. Um, and this, to me, was like the cream of the crop. You're looking at a high ratio Casada variant. Um, I had no doubt that this one would do well. Right, yeah, especially Casada with the Star Wars. The, the one you previously mentioned, that book has become hard to find. Especially you're not finding it for, what, under $200, $250, I think. It, that Right. Um, I think that's graded. I'm not sure what they were going for raw. I know. Um, I think I saw a raw recently. Now it was an auction, so it could have been off a little bit, but it went for about $160. Yeah. Um, but either way, that's the kind of pricing I would sort of expect to see um, out of this one because that for, while the Force Awakens one was a 1 in 100, the print run is going to be much higher on that book than you're going to see from this book. Yeah, I know Scott Reagan from Tales from Flips. I was hunting that uh, that other variant for a while, <laughs> and he finally got a copy. But I still like speaking of Casada. I still like that uh, Ghost Spider Casada that he did. You get those for one in fifty, and get those for like way under ratio right now, thirty five, forty bucks. Yeah, that one has a lot of potential. 
But the next one in the variant buzz was Valkyrie number three. This is the Stephanie Hans variant. Yeah, and this one is one of those books that people were talking about out the gate. Hans does it, I think, with the color, um, the use of color. You know, I, I've, I've heard a lot of people trying to spec on this book based on Jane Foster. I don't think that that's – could she become a Valkyrie and, be, and this become something to speculate on down the road quite possibly? But now that we know that Jane Foster is going to be Thor, um, I don't necessarily think this series has – Huge long-term speculation potential from that angle. I think that the key for this is the fact that it's, you know, a variant. It's a how many stores are ordering 25 copies of this type of book. Um, and the gorgeous cover art. I think that's the driving factor in the speculation. And I said when we talked on the Hot and Cold show, I said, man, there's, there's some excellent variants getting released this week. And um, this is a prime example of that. All right, I just wanted to curious of what the sales figures were for like the previous issues to see how many there were out there i think how many how many issues of jane foster valkyrie 2 were sold how many you know but yeah and and prices on this one are all over the place they've gone from a little bit under ratio to at ratio but it's interesting you see far less of this book listed than you do the average 125 so i think this one is is one that's going to dry up and have a chance to raise in value gotcha just looking real quick because now I'm curious. Do, 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 do. <laughs> oh, that's it. Too much dead air. Anyways, find that later. But yeah, huge fan of Stephanie Hans. A lot of her covers, to me, I pick up just because of the artwork. Um, whether they're rise in value, low in value, either way. Especially those die covers, I, I've enjoyed those. One thing I like about this Valkyrie book is is like the, the the floating skulls that you see there that that's pretty badass to me but yeah let me know um I, full disclosure i picked this up just for the cover i haven't been reading this book but next one you have in the variant buzz section is savage avengers this is number four second print right right so there when i did not have this book initially on the bolo list when it first released first off savage avengers is a solid read if you're not reading savage avengers it's a good read it's a little bit out there obviously avengers with conan um but lots of reader buzz i've heard it called by some to be the best team book marvel was putting out before house of x and powers of x came out um but this issue was heavily talked about for two reasons um the symbiote sword that conan wields and this kind of crazy symbiote dragon that ends up bonding in this issue. And hey, here's an example of a second print where both are now on the cover. So um, everything symbiote is hot. Obviously, Savage Avengers is not hugely printed. Um, A second print is gonna be printed even lower. Uh, I think the cover art will do it very, very well. I think this could be a tough find. This could be one that you don't see at every LCS. So, um, I don't think you're going to see a movie of Savage Avengers. Even if you do, I don't think you're going to see a symbiote sword. Nonetheless, um, this could be one of those unique things that people can't get their hands on. Um, And uh, symbiote collectors are ravenous right now. They want everything. They want everything symbiote. So this is one to keep an eye out for. Um, It was one that I saw several of like the Venom related accounts that I follow who do a great job of like letting us know about all the symbiote things going on in the comic market, they were all posting this book, and that put that book on my radar for sure. This just in. So, Valkyrie Jane Foster number two had estimated sales of 43,640. And then second print, or whatever, the last printing of number one had 2,774. So that's Comicron. We all know that that's not a actual print run number but that's close you get to kind of an estimate and we know you can't just go strictly one in 25 from that number because there might be overages however diamond prints there's but it kind of gives you at least a gauge to look at for that valkyrie valkyrie variant that we're just just all right so i'd expect 800 to 1200 on the market somewhere kind of in that range right 
Yeah, because you figure probably number three probably dropped a little bit. I'd say number two is at 43, almost 44. I'd say, what, 38, 39 maybe? Who knows? I would say even lower. Usually, you know, James Hake tells us usually you expect like that 50% drop off. Um, so I, I don't know. I don't know how many people are truly reading that. Uh, it, it, you know what else would depend, Brian, is when did they release that cover art image? If they released it early enough, stores could, probably would have ordered more so they could get that 125. Um, it certainly lightens the load if you know you can sell a 125 for ratio and, and really save some money. Yeah. And then, of course, a lot of people watch it probably like, who cares? It's, it's freaking Valkyrie. But <laughs> That's kind of how I feel about it, but <laughs> if I'm being honest. If it wasn't Stephanie Hans, I'd definitely be that way, but yeah. Then the next book we had for the Variant Buzz was the the Black Panther Agents of Wakanda number one. Yeah, if this is one from a spec perspective, you never know. Um, I think Black Panther is a success, right? So who knows where we're going to go with the movies in the future? Plus it's a 1 in 50 with the hot artist. Right. I think that's more why this is popular, though. It's more, I mean, I think you... This is not the first appearance of the Agents of Wakanda. I think they showed up in the actual Black Panther series. But you know how I feel about team first appearances. So um, I look at this one more for a 1 in 50 book on a title that was getting kind of slept on. Uh, wasn't really talked about. And then uh, is this in Yuck Lee again? Yes. So, yeah. So, again... Uh, you know, this is the difference between a Marvel book and a DC book where in Lee doing a one in 50 versus a DC cover B. Um, there's a lot more potential here long term. Yeah, I'm curious of of how popular this was and how many were ordered, especially like as popular as Black Panther is. But great cover. I haven't been following the Black Panther book, but either way. A lot of people haven't liked it. There's been a lot of people talking about lately. It seems uh, to have – people have had negative feelings about the the story. But the, anything that's symbiote-related has gotten them excited again. That Black Panther 2 uh, second print is yeah. on fire right now. I was I was reading the, when they first started with um, – when they expanded past Wakanda and they started with the whole space. And I just kind of fell off of it. But – then the next book, this is one of the hot ones right now, especially with Boom and their later printings. This is Something is Killing the Children, third print. Right. So, again, Boom is killing it. Um, we're seeing this with Once in the Future and Something is Killing the Children. Um, they are kind of leading the way with, the, with their style of um, – pre-planned kind of print runs and these the anticipation of market demand um there was an article on bleeding cool i'm trying to pull it up now uh so that i don't misquote who actually was interviewed in uh in the article okay here it is flip uh sablik um where he kind of answered all of the it was well he didn't answer he asked the questions and answered the questions it was kind of a uh a uh, frequently asked questions kind of thing um, that was posted on uh, on um, Bleeding Cool. But it was really informative. I don't know where it actually came from. It probably came from Boom's website. But um, it was really informative because it's what Brian and I kind of already knew to be the case. But now the public is, is learning. A lot of people felt some sort of way about how Boom did this. But in an effort to... Um, you know, to ensure that they had these books ready um, and that they were able to continue to meet demand, they had to kind of anticipate what the demand would be for these books, and they predetermined the print runs for later printings. And in doing that, they were wrong. There was much more of a demand for the books than they anticipated. But guys, that's a good thing. When demand outweighs supply, guess what happens? You make money. A lot of people watching the show, you're speculators, right? That's what you're trying to do. Um, and they allocated the books down to the next book. Um, they said they're not going to do that anymore. They said if you in the future, they are, they're going to continue doing this, by the way. Boom said they're going to continue doing this. So this is going to continue to be the way that they approach these later printings. They're going to try to estimate a print run. They're going to put the print run, the print out. 
they are hoping that it goes how it went with something's killing the children and um and once a future uh flip described it as catching lightning in a bottle um i would say so being that every print is doing exceptionally well um selling out at retail level selling out at distributor level um but they said they're not gonna like just pass retailers off to the next book the next time they're gonna have retailers reorder and try to get back in um they said they're also going to do a better job of allowing retailers to be aware from the get-go that these books may be allocated. But um, they, they answered the question from three perspectives. They answered the question from a reader perspective. And they said for, they said for the readers who are upset, they would say that the sixth print of Once and Future and the fourth print of Something's Killing the Children will be the last printings and they will be overprinted. They're going to actually do an overage over whatever the orders are. They'll... they'll They'll print to order, and then they'll do an overage in order to get it in every reader's hands possible. Um, and then they answered for kind of collectors, and they talked about you know um, the fact that the chase is kind of part of it. Um, and then they answered kind of for speculators who said the speculators are the one really driving this. Um, and if you are kind of somebody who caters to speculators – um, then they're just going to kind of have to understand that this is kind of like part of the game. Part of what makes a book popular is the, you know, the supply out, out you know, not outweighing the demand and, and it being the opposite way. And, um, you know, they hope they're lucky enough to have a situation like this happen again. I just thought it was also cool that a publisher acknowledged speculators being a large portion of the market. Um, so, Boom knows what they're doing. They're not trying to, say, cheat or artificially do anything. Um, they were trying to anticipate. Um, and we jumped all over this book as a community on a larger basis than most of their releases typically are. And that caused these spikes that we're seeing. Right. I mean, and then the next book also we kind of put into this was the fourth print to Once in Future number one. Boom... Shout out to Ross Ritchie. Shout out to Arun Singh, um, supporters of the channel. Arun's been on here a couple times. But great stories so far, man. Especially, I'm excited about, uh, what is it, Burning Skies of East Berlin? Yes. Always yes. mix that title up. <laughs> but I'm um, excited to look in, into that. We did have an advanced copy of the PDF, so anxious to see great story i don't think it's going to have as much buzz we kind of mentioned that before as once in future or something is killing children but still a great read um we said once in future is great and then we got hit with the something is killing the children and it was like yeah we both said that book is effed up but it's good and that's the reason why you're seeing all these other printings of it right and and something to also remember guys is boom has a program with retailers where that they they can opt in to take part in where they could have gotten like issues one through four fully returnable. So they could have ordered as many as they wanted of the first print and make sure they had them in store. That's why some stores, I, we heard a lot of people talking saying, well, oh, this is artificial demand because my store has a ton of number one it's first prints. Well, that's because your store took advantage of the program and ordered up. They, they wanted to make sure they had them um, in case there was a um, the demand that we see on it. Um, I think Boom did a good job addressing each of the segments of the market, or at least attempting to, and it, uh, certainly a better job than most publishers do, um, for sure. And you know what? I'm going to give you another bolo right now. I'm going to give you something else to kind of keep your eye out for. Folklords from Boom Studios. Um, and everybody freak out, because guess what? We're talking pre-FOC spec. But on the channel, we told you guys once in future... We told you guys something is killing the children. I'm not taking credit, by the way, for the spikes on those whatsoever. Um, but Folklords, I think, has a solid chance of being another book that follows this trend and is in incredible demand. So Folklords, 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 pay attention to that. That's going to wrap up the Variant Buzz section. So now we're going to get into Jack's long-term play of the week and it's the book that we haven't talked about so far on the list tonight and that is of course spider-man number one this is like the jj abrams book yes jj abrams his son henry abrams co-written um 
it was uh, certainly met with a lot of media fervor um, when this was announced. Um, and, you know, I think it was also met with some skepticism. Um, I think a lot of people thought that the popularity of this book would be based upon J.J. Abrams. Um, and we heard people say, the Boo Birds, they start saying things like, well, other Hollywood types have written a book. This won't, this won't work. This won't work. So as soon as my article was posted on comicbookinvest.com, if you're not familiar, I post the bolo list, not just on Instagram and Twitter and LinkedIn and Facebook. That's right. It's on LinkedIn. But I also post it on comicbookinvest.com with a back issue bolo section. Today's back issue bolo section focused on Venomized Hulk. But I immediately got a comment from another CBSI writer, ironically enough, um, kind of hating on this pick. And um, comparing it to other Spider-Man number ones um, that have been released. Um, but the funny thing about that comparison is it's pretty clear he didn't read this book. Um, but I did. And did you guys read this book? Did any of you anticipate this being the type of story that it turned out to be? Because I didn't. My initial perception was the same as the writer who um, kind of negged the pick. Um, who... My initial perception was, that's eh, another Spider-Man number one. We've had Spider-Man number ones, right? We've done Miles Morales. We've done uh, the Todd McFarlane number one. You know, they're just calling it Spider-Man because it's not Amazing Spider-Man. And it's just this is J.J. Abrams story. All of the spec for this book surrounded uh, Cadaverous, right? Um, this new villain. Um, and people feel some sort of way about the villain spec, right? So this comment... It, that immediately came onto the list said, well, you know, villain spec, that's short-lived. But Brian, didn't we talk about that last night on the Hot and Cold show? Yes. Villain spec is changing. Um, villain spec is hot right now. People are paying attention to it. Now, we're going to talk spoilers here, guys. This villain, right off the bat, kills one of the most important characters in the Marvel Universe. And we're talking Mary Jane, right off the bat. Mary Jane done for um now if that doesn't get your attention what else does a villain have to do within the first few pages of their inception right um but you know what that's not even why i'm paying attention to this book um that's not even what gets me about this book i thought this was going to be like most people probably a peter parker story i thought this was Another just J.J. Abrams take on J.J. Abrams wants to write Spider-Man, so he's writing Spider-Man. He's got that kind of clout. Or J.J. Abrams wants to write Spider-Man, um, or his kid wants to write Spider-Man, so he's using his clout to get his kid a, a, a Marvel writing job. That's the way I took it, right? And yeah, we've seen a lot of ce celebrities write um, comics. Um, my favorite is uh, CM Punk, my favorite professional wrestler of all time, writing Drax the Destroyer. It's a fun story. Um, but that's not what I think this is. I think there's some speculation here. First off, this to me checks all the boxes. It was a fun read. Also, full disclosure, I don't really like Spider-Man that much. I don't, I've said that before on this channel. Like, he doesn't, I don't resonate with Spider-Man. My life, I didn't grow up like Spider-Man. Um, he just, it's not my type of character. But I enjoyed reading this book. Um, it was not the book I envisioned being the long-term play of the week. Bolo Nation, Simpleman's Comics Family, what book do you think I had penciled in as my long-term play of the week? Well, of course, G.I. Joe number one. Of course. Of course that's what I was going to – full plans to come on the mic and talk G.I. Joe number one. But I had my eye on Cadaverous. Had my eye on it. Really liked that Delato 1 in 50, even though I think it might be recycled art. I'm not sure. But, you know, I'm a Delato guy. That's a 1 in 50. That's nice. I loved that uh, Perio Frankie's Comics. Yes, we're sponsored by Frankie's Comics, but this is why I think I'm proud of like the sponsorships that we have because like Nick at Slabbed Heroes does as good a work as any human being on this planet when it comes to shipping you comic books, when it comes to pressing your comic books, it comes to guaranteeing your 98s. I'm proud to represent Slabbed Heroes. Let me tell you something about Kevin Fields. He creates the most unique variants in my opinion on the market that's my opinion um and i'm proud to represent his brand um you know from that all purple blank 
uh, Joker variant that you guys, I posted on Instagram, you guys loved it, um, to something like this, having the foresight to get cadaverous on a cover, um, something you don't see with any of like the regular releases. Um, so, and then a hot artist like Perio at that. And I think that book is still available on frankiescomics.com. Um, Nick from Slab Heroes, again, to shout him out again. You know what he was all over? That s- middle cover on the top. That is a Chip Kid variant. Chip Kid, you may remember. That name sounds familiar, but maybe you're not exactly sure. He did all of those, I'll say, kind of terrible convergence cover B variants during the DC Convergence story. He's kind of like got that advertising style. But that variant cover was an FOC variant. A lot of stores miss that variant. I think it's going to be lower printed and tougher to get. But this issue also, it has that reader buzz. People were talking about it. I say follow the money. Marvel went J.J. Abrams. They put a huge marketing push behind this book. There's money behind it. We got the villain. Okay, new villain. You got a little spec play here. He kills a major beloved character. Okay, we've got a major death in this issue. Now how about we have the fact that Benji Parker takes over as Spider-Man in this issue. Peter quits after Mary Jane dies, retires as Spider-Man. Benji Parker takes over. He's given the suit. He takes over as Spider-Man. Who knew that this was going to be a completely different take on Spider-Man? Um, now, what is popping on the secondary market? You've probably already mentioned it in the comments by now, right? That first appearance of Benji Parker. Um, I'm feeling dyslexic. I don't remember if it's Spider-Man 59, Spider-Girl 59 or 95, but that book is going through the roof. It's going for like 100 bucks, right? Uh, the funny thing is a lot of people don't read their comics. So that book is hot, and this is zero shade. Okay, I'm going to say this right now before any – I get comments, before people say anything. That book's hot because it was a key collector alert. Key collector put that alert out a day before the release of this book. They let everybody know, hey, this is the first appearance of this character. Um, I'm not hating on key collector. That Key collector has an incredible effect on the market. Um, and I don't even necessarily think that that's a bad thing. Um, so it's not about them. But that's just a fact. That, that's how that happened. Um, but it's interesting. Our own Topher S., um, the man behind True First, he would actually call that appearance a True First. Maybe not a first full for all of you. You guys know how I feel. I hate that term, right? But if you're a first full guy, if you're a Hulk 181 guy, um, that Spider-Girl uh, – Appearance, that's a baby appearance. That's Benji as a baby. That's not Benji as what Benji is in this issue. So if you're in that like Hulk 181 category, um, this could be argued as Benji's first appearance. If you're going to tell me no because the market spoke already and it's the other book, then I'm going to tell you you're proving my point. Because the market contradicts itself based on where people have already spent their money. Because people are already spending big money on this book on the back issue because of the Key Collector release. Again, not on Key Collector, not their fault. They're trying to do their job. Um, But that's just reality. So that's how the market works. So I think there's going to be people, if this series takes off with the popularity I expect it to, who are going to make the claim that this is a a first appearance of Benji Parker. At the very least, right, it's the first appearance of Benji Parker as Spider-Man. And why is all this important? Right here. If you can see right over my left shoulder, um, that's the Into the Spider-Verse poster. We know there's more Spider-Verse movies coming. Now, I'm sure Into the Spider-Verse number two is already in the works, right? But with the insane popularity of that movie and the way it affected the speculation market, how cool would it be to see another Spider-Man show up in that movie and be like, I'm your son? And Spider-Man have to deal with, wait, what? I have a son and he's Spider-Man? It's perfect, guys. That's perfect. So I feel like you've got multiple spec plays with this one book, Cadaverous. 
Look how Donny Cates takes characters from other books, whether they're in continuity or not in continuity. Could Cadaverous show up in ASM at some point? Yeah, absolutely. Some other writer could be like, oh, this is a cool character. I'm going to write this character into my story. So you've got Cadaverous. You've got the Into the Spider-Verse possibility of Benji Parker, first Spider-Man. You've got the fact that there's a lot of Marvel financial marketing and media support behind this book. You've got some cool variants. You've got a unique store exclusive. Um, in my mind, all boxes checked. So this is not a book that I intended on coming on the mic and talking about. This is a book that caught me off guard that I thought would just be another Marvel number one to release. Um, I tell you what, another unique one out there is there's, uh, there's also like a Shannon Mayer exclusive that's got Mary Jane on the cover that I could see some heat, but, um, I really like this cadaverous variant myself. Um, you know, I think that this is one that caught me off guard. This is one I thought was created, you know, from a marketing perspective for those store exclusive for the oversaturation. No, I think this book has legs. I think this is a long-term winner. That's why I pick these long-term picks of the week because it may take a while for cover A to, to pop off, but this book has everything it takes and it can pop off in multiple different ways in multiple different times and it may take a couple years, but that's why this isn't the short-term pick of the week. This is the long-term pick of the week. I'm excited about this book if you can't tell. Um, I was excited when somebody came at me about this pick. Because I knew I had all the ammo for this pick. Um, so let me know in the comment section, did you read this book? Did you buy this book? What variant covers did you like? Did you know that that Chip Kid variant was an FOC variant and it's actually pretty short printed compared to the other variants? Um, what do you think of the Frankie's Comics variant? What do you think of Cadaverous? What do you think of Benji Parker as Spider-Man? Um, what's your feeling on first appearance? Are we looking at that Spider Girl issue, or should we be looking at uh, this as a real first appearance? Um, what's the comic politicians gonna say? Um, let us know. Let's hear it in the comments. If you agree, disagree, anything in between, I'd love to hear it. But this is my long-term pick of the week: Spider-Man number one, JJ and Henry a Abrams. I'm excited for issue two. Will you talk about that? first appearance it reminds me of the whole john john kent debate that just happened like what two years ago that's my point see now here's the funny thing is i'm gonna get hammered for like almost insinuating that the baby appearance is not a first appearance i think a first appearance is a first appearance and there's no rule against babies i interviewed lee weeks who did the jonathan kent issue right and i asked him i said what's i just blatantly asked him i said what's the first appearance of jonathan kent you know what he did brian he laughed at me. He goes, didn't we depict his birth? So in his mind, well, of course, that's his, that's his first appearance. But we, the market, we have these crazy rules that say baby appearances aren't first appearances. This isn't a first appearance. That is a first appearance. If you're going to argue that that spider girl um, one is a first appearance, and again, I haven't checked out that book. It's just amazing to me that people spend $100 without them checking that book. Yeah. But – Somebody who I really trust in Topher, who has checked out that book, has gone on record saying that that is a child appearance, that is a baby appearance. And if that's a first appearance, then there's no doubt that that Convergence book is the first appearance of Jonathan Kent, no doubt. And that Cable, as a baby, has to be a first appearance. That you cannot argue New Mutants 86 or 87 anymore. And, if, and again, that's why... I make my entire point. I am not hoarding Hulk 180s. I am not manipulating the market. Um, it is, I don't even have a 180 or a 181 for full disclosure. Um, it is purely the fact that I, as somebody who has a position and opinion, like we all deserve and have the right to have, um, share my opinion on this microphone. And my opinion is, as a community, we have a flawed set of rules around first appearances and it gets illustrated perfectly in this release so what are people gonna do are, are everybody who spent that hundred dollars brian on that spider girl book are they out 100 bucks 
I bet they're not. I bet we're going to make that the first appearance, not this. And this will be called the first appearance as Benji as Spider-Man. Because we've got to create more than one first appearance and muddle the market again. That's what's going to happen. I don't have any problem calling it the first appearance, but I just... I think the value should lie where the character is being with being what they're supposed to be. Right. Like, the first appearance, no problem. That's first appearance. But it's like... I don't know, especially when you say when you put it like that as a baby, I'm like, why am I giving money for like? <laughs> but that's this I look at it as like an actual baby. Someone that a baby's not gonna provide me any value. It's a freaking baby. But then I have over here the actual character that's doing what what they're known for. That's where the value is gonna lie. That's the first but that, appearance. But the value is gonna lie what they're known for. But that's the FOMO nature of the market again. And that's why I brought up Key Collector because I'm trying to be full disclosure, full transparency. And again, shout out to Nick from Key Collector. I'm not. Nick will know that I'm not talking junk, but somebody, some follower of Key Collector is going to go jump and be like, oh, did you see Mr. Bolo was talking junk about Nick? Not the case. I'm just saying it's a, it's a natural course. Nick goes and tries to find the first appearance of this character. He finds it. He puts it out there. Everybody runs and spends $100 on this book because they're like, this is going to be the biggest thing since sliced bread. And they didn't read the book. And now when these questions get asked, Instead of going, well, is that which book should we be more interested in? Now we're going to be affected by how much money was already spent. That's and that's again, that's not Nick's problem or Nick's fault. That's us as a market and how we can't have these questions without we can't just base these questions purely on your logic that you just said because your logic doesn't include the fact that somebody already spent a hundred dollars on a book and then I'm going to get told that I'm trying to change the market or manipulate the market and and the market already spoke. Like the market can never be wrong. Like the market doesn't make mistakes. Like the market isn't filled with people who have a FOMO disorder, who, who are racing to get books as fast as they can. People want to beat up on Key Collector and say like, well, they're trying to get news out as fast as they can, so they're making mistakes. Speculators are making mistakes because they're trying to acquire books as fast as they can without doing their due diligence. So, you know, it that's the way the market goes. That's what ends up happening. But either way, I like this appearance. I don't hate that. By the way, I don't hate that Spider-Girl book. I like that Spider-Girl book. I think it has value. It just perfectly works into this conversation that we've been having about first appearances on this channel. Either way, I think whether this book gets a first appearance of Benji or it's just the first appearance of him as Spider-Man doesn't matter to me. Like I said, you need five or six good reasons why this book could be solid, and I think this is the best one. The fact that I think that that character is made for Into the Spider-Verse would be great there. And uh, who better than J.J. Abrams to be so cinematic with a story, right? I mean, that was, that was excellent. I was pumped about that. You act like it was just him. His son was there, too. Oh, yeah. Right. Well, <laughs> you know, the truth is we really don't know whose story this was. Like I said, this could have been Henry Abrams' story and J.J.'s just the guy who has the clout to make it happen. Um, or it could be J.J. Abrams' story and he's trying to get his son over. We don't really know. I think it should be like the next issue should be like where he's got a CDL and he finds out, oh, this is my son. So then they drive all over the, the country with some Kenny Loggins music, and then they go to this big arm wrestling tournament, and then he turns his hat backwards and wins. That'd be just freaking <laughs> awesome. You are stuck in the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> That's my youth, man. Living in Germany, all you did was watch movies because you had one channel on AFN. But I, I know when Brian makes these references, we have some like 22-year-old who watched the channel. Yeah, what is he talking what the about? the hell is he talking about? It's over the top, man. Look it up. Inst instantly, I know what you're talking yeah. about. But <laughs> somebody, somebody's sitting there like, what the hell is he talking yeah, about? Yeah, this guy's horrible. I think <laughs> yeah. he doesn't write books. He's all a bitch. <laughs> like, yeah, that's a terrible idea for a comic. <laughs> yeah. Now we're just – anyways – that's the bowl list tonight, guys. I appreciate everyone watching. Also, make sure you turn in here. We're going to have the live premiere tomorrow night. Last call. Bring yourself some adult Kool-Aids. It is the end of the week. And we're going to have the FOC show. And we're going to talk about our 10 books that we're liking for FOC for Monday night. Now we're telling 
Some are great covers, some are great art, some we might have some spec, some we just interested in reading. So either way, last call, FOC show tomorrow night, 9 p.m. Jack, you get the last you get the last words after I talk about the last call. Well, you know, I just want to say again, thank you for everybody for tuning in. Thank you for everybody in the live chat. In the final comment section of this video, let us know what book you were buying. Let us know what books you were hyped about. Again, this is your show. We want to know what you guys like um, and what you guys are into. And uh, again, thank you for joining us. Right. And good night, guys.